Good morning, Rise Church. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Devin. I'm the next gen pastor here at Rise Church. So we are meeting in person today at the Historical Park in downtown Romulus. If any of you are und still undecided about coming, take this as a personal invite from me to you to come hang out with us. It's a great time to just get to know each other and have fellowship. If you can't make it, know that I still appreciate and love that you're joining us virtually. But hey, we still have some other pretty big announcements. So this will be the last week of Bloom. And I have loved getting to know you girls. But it's a time to end it as we get ready for the uh, fall season school to start. And then we're going to rejoin this. We're going to reopen this up in the winter again. But it's going to be the last week. So girls, if you maybe consider coming and you haven't yet, jump in with us. I'd love to see you there. You can email me for more information at nextgen@theriseschurch.com. So at least for the next season, you know what it's about. It's going to be a great time. Girls, we're just going to hang out. We're going to go through a little scripture. We're just going to really enjoy our time together for the last time, talk about our plans going forward. So that's this Tuesday at 7 p.m. And it's also going to be our last fortnight coming up, not this week, but next week on the Tuesday at 7 p.m. So if you're a young guy who likes video games, who likes hanging out, who just likes talking and maybe learning about scripture, 
feel free to jump in for the last week there. I'd love to see you. We're going to play some video games. We're going to read the last bit of John, the book of John, verse uh, chapter 20 and 21. And then we're just going to talk, talk about what's going forward here and, and just enjoy each other. And we're still going to communicate, you know, throughout this time. The group isn't dead. Neither one is. But I just want to let you know we're taking a break for the season coming up here. So this is going to be the last Tuesdays for this Tuesday and next Tuesday for our small groups virtually. And the last big announcement we have is we have a new series starting today so this is super exciting for me uh, it's about authority and authority is such a big thing in all of our lives right now so we're gonna talk about biblical authority this week talking about from the Bible the Bible's authority so I want to ask have you ever wondered about authority like who gives a person the right to be the boss over you or why do you have to listen to what the Bible says or maybe you just wonder like why Jesus has authority even while here on earth, like what gives them the authority to say these things and do these things? Well, we're going to explore all these issues and explore what, how they make sense. And I can't wait to break down these issues, these things, along with many other things and starting with you today, this Sunday. But before I jump into the next series, we have some worship for you guys. So stay tuned and I'll be right back with you after that. See ya.
Welcome back. So this week, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about authority. So I was thinking about like, where do I even start in this message, in this series? And so the first form of authority from God, I think we really need to look at is scripture. Because after we understand the scriptures where we get everything we know about God, then we can start exploring other aspects of authority. So how many of you have ever questioned something in the Bible? I want to ask that first. How many of you ever thought like, man, uh, this instance in the Bible doesn't seem very fair or like, or loving, or it doesn't make sense, or it doesn't line up with how I know God, or I'm confused on this. Or maybe you don't understand how some people would even question the Bible because it's from God and God is not an author of lies, but he's the author of truth. So you'd be like, man, how do I explain that to somebody? Well, we're going to clarify if you have questions about that or if you want to help clarify somebody on that. We're going to be exploring that today right now. And while we're going to be discussing this today, and maybe at the end of this, you'll have a better understanding to trust God over what you think and also be able to explain to other people and why the Bible has such a high level of authority. But first, let me ask you this. What makes something good or bad? Maybe some of you think God's word, the Bible. And to those of you who say that, I would 100% agree with you on that. Yes, you're exactly right. But maybe some of you think, like, well, my, what my parents say makes them good or bad. Well, 90% of the time, sure. I know some parents would be mad at me for saying 90%, but we're human. We all make mistakes, so 90%. So let's play a game, kind of like just a true or false game here, and you got to guess whether this law in Michigan is true or false. So the first one is, there's a law that's going to bother you, the ladies here. So the first one is kind of going to gonna make you ladies upset. I don't agree with it, just making it clear. But let's see if it's true or false, because I could just make it up. And uh, the law is that a woman isn't allowed to cut her hair without her husband's permission. Do you think that's true, or do you think that's false? I'm just going to say that uh, if that's true... And if I try to tell my wife she can or can't get a haircut, I'm probably going to end up going missing. So even if it's true, I'm not going to do it. So what do you think? That is actually true. That is a law in Michigan that a husband can tell a woman she can't get a haircut or she can. She needs his permission. So then the other side, this one picking on the guys, do you think this one is true or false? On Sunday, it's illegal to even look at your wife with a scowl look. That means like you can't look at her with negativity or disagreement. (laughs) Do you think that's true or false? That's actually true, unfortunately. So I don't know about y'all, but uh, on Sundays I go to church and then right after that I go watch some football in the afternoon and at night. And if my wife tries to get me to do something while while I'm trying to watch the game or if it's the fourth quarter or whatever, you know what look she's going to get? A scowl. So I can go to jail for that apparently. So I should definitely be going to jail. (laughs) So the third one is, how many of you guys think this is true or false? That there's a law in Rochester, Michigan, around the corner from here, that legally all bathing suits have to be inspected by police officers. How many of you guys think that's true or false? Well, that is true. That is actually true. So good luck having fun at your uh, pool party as the police have to inspect all your bathing suits. Now, here's one that often makes me think, like, why would this even be a law? But here it is. Do you think it's true or false? It's the last one. In some cities in Michigan, it's illegal to paint sparrows and sell them as parakeets. (laughs) You think it's illegal to, to paint a bird and sell it as parakeet? That actually is a law, yes, unfortunately. But what has happened to where, like, has there been enough people painting sparrows and selling them as parakeets that they had to make this a law? Like, that's crazy. Uh, So (laughs) I guess there's that many people that used to do that. But there have been laws that were even, like, wrong. And my whole point is that the law doesn't make something right or wrong does. God does. And there have been laws that were really wrong. Like, I even think back to segregation laws from black and white people. Like, my grandma and grandpa, when they were getting together... Uh, they just passed, they just got rid of laws that would have not allowed them to get a house together because they were, one was white, one was black. Like, that's crazy that that's just my grandparents from not that long ago. So that's crazy. There's been laws that are good, and there's definitely laws that are bad, and there's laws that make no sense. So, but the thing is, God's law 
make something right or wrong. God's law is the only thing we should be following. We shouldn't put so much emphasis on human law. So that's the first step of biblical authority we're going to look at. It's based on the Bible. So first, we'll read a passage out of 2 Timothy, and we'll start at verse 14, and then we'll end the chapter to the very last uh, passage there, verse 17. So I'll read it for you. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy, since a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In another uh, translation there, it says, for that... um. Uh, the, the verse that says all scripture is God breathed, it says all scripture is inspired by God. A lot of other translations say that. But I want you to look at the word authority and notice something about it like A U T H O R I T Y. Think about that word. It has author in it. Ever think that's like by coincidence? No, it's because they came from the same word. And really, it means that if you're an author of something, you should have authority in what you're talking about. So notice. Who writes the Bible? Some of you will say, well, there's, you know, there, there's uh, 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament. Good for you for knowing that. There's 66 books in the Bible. Bible just means Babel, many books. And that has lots of authors. But really, the author is God. That's the author. And God gives authority into what he's writing about. Think about all the things God talks about in, in, in the Bible. He talks about our life, our salvation, what's right, what's wrong, love, hate, peace, war. He covers like almost everything. And in the book, he says that he is all-knowing, all-powerful. He is the ultimate, the omega, the alpha. So God is literally saying that he has all authority and he's giving this book authority. And it says all scripture is God-breathed or inspired by God. That's what that verse up there said. I don't know if you caught that at the end there, but it says all scripture is God breathed. And like I said, the other translation says all scripture is inspired by God. So that means the real author isn't all those individual authors. It's God. And that leads me to my point, my first point, which is the author gives authority and the author is God. So I want to look at something important here, just to kind of back that point up with some other scripture to kind of like reinforce it. Hebrews 3, 7 to 11, let's open to that. And I'm going to stay focused right on the very first verse there, verse 7, which a lot of people will just gloss over. So it says, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, that's the important verse there, which a lot of people are like, why would that be important? But then continue the verse 8. Do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the wilderness. We your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said their hearts are going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger that they shall never enter my rest. So I want to point out something here. That this was actually, it's referencing this like quote there was from Psalm 95, which a lot of people believe, uh, basically everyone believes, that David wrote that. So David, you know, King David, the one who killed Goliath, he was also a poet and he wrote this. But did you notice what verse 7 said? It didn't say, King David once said, look at the top verse. Verse 7 says, as the Holy Spirit says. Right here is a direct indicator, something that pointing it it's like points right at the fact that God inspired all scripture that all scripture really comes from God not the so-called author of somebody maybe writing it so the authority of all the words in the bible were inspired and come from God and God just worked through us humans to write this word to put this into a book so that we can give it to everyone else God just worked through us it was the holy spirit working through us now there comes a second set of questions from this like, well, I don't know, uh, think of Paul's teachings, for example. Do you think he knew he was speaking on God's behalf and to the whole church? Like, not just when he wrote a letter to an individual church. Do you think he knew he was writing to the whole church for all of time? Probably not, all right? Paul was often speaking to specific people in the church and used specific language. In fact, to the specific people we're talking about, we call original audience. Those are just people that, the original people he was talking to. But look at what Peter said. I'll, I'll 
contrast that here. Look what Peter said about Paul's writing. 2 Peter 3.15 Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. Just as our bro dear brother Paul also wrote with you with the wisdom that God gave him. Peter was recognizing at that time that Paul was writing with the wisdom of God. Not from his own wisdom, but he recognized, Peter was recognizing that Paul was writing with the wisdom of God. He was recognizing that the Holy Spirit was working through him. Even in that time, even to what we would call that original audience, to the people that were originally being spoken to, it was recognized that God was speaking through Paul by Peter. Maybe not by the person themselves. Who knows? Maybe he did recognize that. Often when I write a message, I'm often like, oh man, that was from God, not from me, because I'm not that smart. I think Paul probably did a lot of that too. But it was recognized by other leaders that God was speaking through him. So even in that time, it was recognized that this is God's word being breathed through. So even look at like what Paul's mission from God was. He was known as the apostle to the Gentiles. Like That was a title that people gave him. That was the task God commissioned him with. And also, uh, it's something he called himself. So a Gentile, though, for you guys who maybe don't know, was just someone who wasn't born Hebrew or Jewish, and they were coming from a different faith or culture, a different background, into Christianity or Judaism. And uh, for reference that Paul called himself that, you can look at Romans eleven 13. I'll read it for you. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles inasmuch that I am, as, uh, am a, an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. He called himself, I am an apostle to the Gentiles, right there. So we see that Devin's not just making this up. This is actually in Scripture. He is the apostle to the Gentiles. So look at how Paul stayed so true to that calling. Like if Paul just started doing his own thing, you'd probably be like, well, God called you on this mission to the Gentiles and to lead the church and to disciple many and to spread his word from one end of the earth to the other. Like, but you're doing other things that don't match that. Like that wouldn't make sense. So you look at how Paul stayed so true to that calling. And I want you to take any single book that Paul wrote. For those of you who don't know, Paul wrote majority of the New Testament. I mean, any book that was written to uh, a, a church, like Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, even if you look at individual people he was writing to, like 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, look at how they open. Like Ephesians, like there's so many books Paul wrote, all of them open with the same thing. It says, uh, basically, grace and peace to you. And it always is in that order, grace first, then peace, to you from our God, the Father, or, or Lord Jesus Christ. It's almost those exact words every single time. And I want you to know something about that grace and peace that he says there. He stick to God's mission because when Jews met each other, when somebody in Hebrew culture would meet each other, or when they would leave, they would say shalom, which meant peace be with you. So on the other end of that, the Gentiles had this phrase called cheros, which meant uh, God's grace be upon you. So when he opened each of his letters at the end of the introduction, he would always say, grace and peace be to you. He took the, the welcoming from the, the Gentiles and took the welcoming to the Hebrews and said, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, you are both one. And he combined that Charles and Shalom together to make it to where when he made an introduction, it was both. He was speaking to both. He was always so clear on that to make sure the churches knew that it wasn't just Hebrews or just Jews. It was everyone. We are not one or the other anymore. We are one family. We are Christians. So I love that he stayed so true to what God was telling him to do. And it's shown that the Holy Spirit was working through him because of small reasons like that, just as the Holy Spirit was working through all of the authors in the Bible. Just like how it said that Holy Spirit said in Psalm 95, even though it was David that said that, the Holy Spirit has always worked through all the authors in the Bible because it is not the authors themselves that write it, but the authors are writing from the inspiration from God. They are writing from what God breathed through them to the scriptures. So it is really not people that are the author, but God is the author. And because God is the author, he gives the writings authority. So this leads me to my second point. All scripture is inerrant, which just means without error. Now we just discussed the real author of the Bible is God, right? Like we have an understanding of that. And God gave the scriptures authority, correct? In fact, we just went through the whole book of John. If you were with us uh, over the last two months, we went through the whole book of John and I want to look at the very first passage in it. It says, John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is living and always has been a part of God, and He just has given us that part of Him so that we may know what's right and wrong. We may know how we have like divine knowledge from God, but more importantly, so that we can know God and that we can have a relationship with God. That's the importance of the Word there. So if the Word is God, and God is perfect, He's without any fault, and He's always holy, how could God tell a lie? That would go against his nature, right? Because God's not going to all of a sudden want to confuse you or lie to you. He's holy. He's all good. So he's going to speak only truth. So when you read scripture, you should know that God is the author because God is the author. God's not going to lie to you. God's not going to give any falsehood. So it has to be true. And if God had some parts that were true and some that weren't, wouldn't God be like a God of confusion and not the God of truth and life? Right, well, he is the truth in life. And in fact, the second part of the Trinity there, Jesus, he often calls himself the truth, the light, and the way. Because he is, was, and always will be exactly that, the truth, light, and way. He's the guiding path to our lives. So if we read something like when Jesus uses the parable of the mustard seed, um, I'll read it for you just so you have a reference there. But we're going to stay focused on the smallest seed part. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that birds, birds may come and perch in its branches. So there's like a lot that you could break down there, but I'm just going to say focus on that little part of the mustard seed to make a point here. Well, he says the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds, right? But it's not. So does that mean that Jesus lied and that Jesus and God aren't the truth? Or was there a deeper truth behind it? Well, there was a deeper truth behind it, and that's what you see through Scripture a lot of times. If you ever have a part of Scripture where you go, well, I don't think that's 100% true, recognize the truth behind it. Recognize what it's actually communicating to you, and I promise you there's truth in that because God isn't going to lie. God, it goes against his nature, and he wouldn't go against his nature because he's holy and just. So just trust, and I want you to have people around you that you can explore these issues with so that you can understand the truth and what God's saying. So now that we know that God gives authority to Scripture, and Scripture is perfect, it's without error because of who it's from. It's from God. God won't lie. It goes against his nature. So if Scripture can't have error. Now comes the question of, what if we messed up over time and we made mistakes? Like God's word may have been perfect at one point, but what if we messed it up and what if we corrupted it? So first I'll say in theory, like, yeah, I guess there's a chance you could have a Bible that uh, was copied and had a typo in it. I'll say I've never come across it and I don't think there, that's very, it would be extremely rare, okay? But I guess by theory there could be. But in general, uh, as far as what the Bibles that we copy off of, the Bible you read now matches the Bible historically. So that's my third and final point. The Bible you read now checks and matches the Bible from 2,000 years ago. It's the same, was the same, and always will be the same. And that short claim is so true. And I'll get down to that in a moment of like why it is, but I wanna talk about like even deeper than that, the Bible, even the New Testament can be shown historically, not just as trusting, but true. Like with recorded evidence and proof of what happened in the New Testament and the Old Testament can be seen in history, but especially the New Testament. In fact, you can see a record of Jesus's lies through like Roman historians. Like we can learn about through Roman historians took like note of how Jesus lived, of the miracles he had, of uh, his trial through Pontius Pilate, through his crucifixion, and the claim that he came back to life and the, the uh, recognition that they could not find the body. That's like in Roman history, that's not even Christian. Like that's crazy, right? So because of this, there's almost no historian that doesn't accept that Jesus even at least existed. Like the man Jesus existed. It's just the claim of whether he's God. But that's amazing that you don't even have to look at the Bible. You can look at history and show that, oh man, this Jesus guy actually existed. 
Well, we're going to look at something called textual criticism, which I know is super boring. And you're like, Devin, I'm about to go back to school. Why are you talking to me about textual criticism? I don't even know about that. But it's important to know. So when you talk to people that question the Bible, you can actually make some of these points and you can argue. And we're just scratching the surface here. But you can start like showing them like the depth of how true the Bible is. And it's important to know this textual criticism because it shows that over the years, the Bible hasn't changed. So Textual criticism, what it is, is it examines the number of early texts or copies we have to, uh, to us today and like it shows the gap between the event and how many writings there were and copies there were and it shows like a level of trustworthiness. So the more copies and text you have and the, the, the less amount of time, the more trustworthy it is of being a real event. So real quick, I'll compare the Bible to some other historical events that we've learned about in school, in history or whatever, and we accept them as true. So like Caesar's Gallic War is a really common one. It had a 950 year gap between the stories being wrote about it and when it took place. And we only have 10 original manuscripts of it. But we teach it in school as a historical event, as truth. Uh, Tectus uh, wrote about all this Roman history over a thousand year period. And we accept this as truth universally, but we only have 20 copies, yet we teach about it. So I want to show you the difference here. The New Testament was written from 40 years to about 150 years, uh, arguably there, after Jesus had uh, risen from the dead and came back. So a lot sooner than those 1,000-year, 950-year gaps. And we even have some of the original writings from when the Bible was made into a book, instead of like a bunch of individual books. Remember, Bible means the bell, which means many books. Well, around 313 AD, after uh, you know Christianity became legalized, we made the Bible into one large book rather than just a bunch of little books. So we even have some of those from like that 300 year period, but we also have a whopping 5,300 Greek Bibles from the time of like, within that 150 year period. We also have another 10,000 Latin transcripts from about 500 years of when Jesus had lived. So when you look at like a thousand year period with 20 copies and you go, that's true. And then you look at Christianity and it's like, we got a, a close to those uh, additional, those 10,000 there. We have 93 other translations from different languages and stuff. So we have like 24,000, 25,000 Bibles within a a three to four hundred year radius and even around a thousand bibles within a hundred and fifty year radius that like there's no comparison for textual criticism that could even match the bible like it's it's unmatched it's literally nothing can even come close and we also had scribes and the scribes their whole job was rewriting and copying the bible and they took that very seriously even with the spacing between letters, they would take like this thick piece of hair, lay it between the spacing of letters, each one, make sure that it was spaced evenly. Like they did crazy things for it. And they would look at like, uh, we'll say the verse, very first words in the Bible are in the beginning. And they wouldn't double check that phrase, say it says in the beginning, in the beginning. Like to double check it. No, they were much more deep than that. They wouldn't even say in, in, word by word. Nope. They wouldn't go letter by letter, I-N, I-N, nope. So if they looked at like the B, they would go, it's a long line this way, and then it's got a big circle at the end. And they would check that aspect of it. They would check the aspects of the letters to make sure the letters and the aspects of them remain the same. And they would do this, and they would also count each letter, each word, each space, each character, from top to bottom, from around six to 10 times each, and then they would have somebody else double check that six to 10 times. And then they would have somebody else double check that their work was right six to 10 times. And then they'd have somebody else come in and double check the whole, like each word the whole way through and then double check that around 10, 15 times. So you'd have like 40, 50 checks by three or four different people of each page of the Bible. Like that's the seriousness they took of recreating or copying the Bible over and over and over and over again. That's the seriousness of the scribes. So when people say like, oh, well, what if man messed it up? It's like they'd have to really mess it up or intentionally change it because that's the level of depth they took to make sure it's new. So a big thing happened in 1947. 1947, I know I'm getting nerdy with the dates here. Um, that's when we found these scrolls that were hidden or lost in the Dead Sea area, and they're called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we were super excited to find these, but also terrified because they were Bibles like the individual books, not even like the Bible from the full Bible we have it, but they're individual books like the letter to Timothy or a letter to the Romans. Like that that was the individual scrolls they were finding that would have each one of those on there. 
And we were excited because we were like, we're going to see if it matches up or not. But we were terrified because we're like, what if it doesn't? And the discover we found. And these were these were scrolls were written. One of them uh, predated Jesus by 300 years, and it was the book of Isaiah. But a lot of them were within a 100-year period of when Jesus lived. So very early on. And we found all these scrolls in 1947. And we found out that 99.7% of it matched to the Bible that we have today, according to, like, the if you match language to language, a 99.7% match. And the 0.3% that you guys are wondering about was either, like, oh, it's illegible, that was one thing, or, uh, but usually they would just scratch that off as, well, we can't properly compare it. Or they would go, uh, this H for he, talking about Jesus capitalized, this one's not. Or there was a comma here and there. It was punctuation. No word changes were in there. So literally, we found Bibles from within 100 years of Jesus existed, and they match the Bible we have today. So there is no issue over what if man messed it up, or what if man didn't get it right, or what if man corrupted it. No, we have the Bibles from then, and we're able to compare them. And we can see that God spoke ultimate authority into this book, and it was only by God that this book was not corrupted. Like, that has to be from God. So because of all this, I truly believe, and I hope you do, we believe that we can trust the Bible we read today is the same Bible we had then. And I believe, because of God, we are able to keep the Bible holy, without issues, without, and by making copies over and over again, not even without a man-made issues. That's incredible. I hope you guys realize that. So I know I'm over my time here. I know I'm well over my time, but it's the first week of authority and checking the authority of the Bible as well, a really big one, and we just scratched the surface here. So if you want to talk more, you can always email me at nextgenauthorizedchurch.com. I'd love to talk more with you about it, but I hope you can understand the authority of the Bible comes from the author, and the author is God. We saw that today. It's not people, it's God. And I hope you can see the Bible is without any error and always remains the truth. And that's because it goes against God's nature. It goes against the author's nature to tell a lie. And finally, I hope you can see the Bible hasn't even changed due to man-made errors. It's been perfect throughout the years. So you can trust in what you're reading today is the same as what people were reading back then. It has not changed. And that's amazing. So I hope you guys can have trust in the authority that Scripture has. And the authority given it to it is from the author, God. So let's pray. God, I thank you for being a God that wants to know me, wants to know us. And, and you have a way to doing so. And that's your word. That's your scripture. That's your knowledge there. And you pass that generation to generation from us. And I, I thank you, God, for blessing it and ordaining it so that it can remain holy, untouched, and perfect throughout the years, throughout the time, so that we couldn't even mess it up. And that every aspect of it is truth from you, God. And we see that, that every piece of scripture comes from you, is inspiration from you. God, and I thank you for giving us that. I thank you for loving us. I thank you for seeing us. And for those of us that are struggling with it, I pray that they can open your word and they can see you now more clearly and just a little more clearly each time they read your word. And that we can be people around other people. We can be your Christians, your sons, your daughters to go around and spread your word and show people the trust that they can have, that the scripture is true and that the Bible shows us what's right and wrong. No silly law does. Nothing people say that only the only thing we know what is right and wrong really comes from you, God. I hope we realize that and I hope we can share that. Be with us as we do that, God. We love you, Jesus. And in your most holy son's name we pray. Amen. So guys, I know that was a lot I just hit you with, and I know I probably spent way too much time, but if you have questions, we only scratch the surface of this. Again, you can email me at nextgenatthrisechurch.com, and if you, uh, maybe you're a kid and you want to do that, maybe you're a teenager you want to do that, maybe you're a parent you want to do that, maybe you're tuning in from YouTube and you've never seen anything about the church, you're a first-time viewer, reach out to me. I would love to have a deeper conversation about this with you guys. It's one of my passion areas. But I also want to say, if you have not left yet and you want to meet with us in person, you still have time. Come to the park, the historical park in downtown Romulus. I'd love to see you all there. So I want you all, I love you all, and I want you to have a blessed day and a blessed week. And more than that, I want you to be a blessing this week. I want you to be a blessing today. And I want you to recognize the blessings in your lives each day, each week, and each month. Love y'all. I hope to see you soon. Bye. So we were walking through the botanical gardens, yeah. and I kid you not, we walk up on a whole section that's nothing but planter's warts.
I thought they were a wart. They're plants. Planters' no. warts. The, no, wait, wait. I, the, the, the things on your feet, right? No, no, no. In they... three seconds, the floor is lava. Three, two, one. <sighs> That was close. <laughs> <laughs> this typewriter is not very comfortable. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, I knocked over my chair, but my feet are not on the floor. <laughs> it's gonna be kind of hard to do the show today, don't you think? Oh, yeah? Yeah. You backing out of a challenge, Brandon? No, I'm not backing out of a challenge. I'm the floor is lava world champion. Oh, dare to dream, my friend, dare to dream. <sighs> okay, 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 let's let's go ahead and start the show before the floor turns back to lava again. Yes, please. Okay. Welcome to the So and So Show. I'm Brandon. And I'm John. Today we're filming our show in the middle of an extreme The Floor is Lava game. And so far we've both avoided being on the lava and thus dying and losing the game. I mean, we're not allowed to use the same thing twice, so it's getting really intense in here. Yeah, that's right. And frankly, we're running out of places to leap to when the floor turns into lava. So mm -hmm. we're, we're coming into the home stretch, yes. I think. True, true. So, 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 you know, maybe we should just go ahead and introduce our new guest. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. He can help us develop our Floor is Lava skills. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Someone who knows stuff. Welcome, sir. Mm -hmm. Who are you and what do you know? Hey, uh, my name is Peter Parkour, mm -hmm. and I'm a parkour expert. Wait, your name is Peter Parkour? Yes. For real? Yeah, ever since I was born. John, what's the problem? Why, why are you making a parkour expert, Mr. Peter Parkour, feel uncomfortable to be on our show? His name is Peter Parkour. Peter Parkour. Yes, yes, and your name is John and my name is Brandon. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound familiar to you. No, should it? You... Peter Parkour? Never mind, never mind. It just sounds eerily similar to somebody I know, you know, somebody who got bit by a radioactive spider. Stop talking nonsense. Mr. Peter Parkour, we are glad you're here. We were hoping that you could uh, help us to rock this game of the floor is lava that we've been playing. Yeah, you are quite the powerhouse. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and as everyone knows, with great power comes great responsibility. Mm. You know, parkour involves seeing one's environment in a new way and navigating around, across, through, over, and under its features. You have to trust your instincts. Mm. Oh yeah, kind of like a uh, spidey sense. Quit bringing up spiders, you know how I feel about them. His name is Peter Parkour. Attention, in three seconds, the floor will be lava. No, 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 you're already on top of the three, deck. Two, one. Ah! Ah! I knew it! I knew it! Ah! Ah! You want the big cushion? Ah! Ah! Oh! Ha <laughs> I'm the floor is lava champion. Oh, well, <laughs> technically. Well, yeah. oh, he doesn't count. He, he only just joined uh, the last round. Well, don't say bad things about our guest. He's right here. Well, I can't compete with somebody who who's, can hang from the rafters. That's true. It's okay, boys. I can train you. Oh. Huh. You don't get to be master of the floor is lava overnight. It takes endless training and practice. Mm -hmm. It takes an awareness of your surroundings. Yeah. You have to have confidence in your instinct and trust what you jumped onto. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is that it takes a lot of confidence for the sport of parkour and for the sport of the floor is lava. That's correct, Brandon. You have to have confidence. Actually, it's a good thing to have in life, not just when you're battling imaginary lava. <laughs> imaginary? You know the floor isn't really lava, right, John? Hey, it's Bible story time with Kellen. Hey, Kellen, what story do you have for us today? Hey, fellas. Today's story is about a few guys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who had to really trust God even in the midst of a burning furnace. This is a good story. I think you'll like it, Mr. Peter Parkour. Mr. Peter Parkour, where do you think he went? Probably to meet up with the Avengers. What are you talking about? Nothing. Go ahead, Kellen. I thought that today, since our story involves fire, we would use s'mores to tell the story. Well, that sounds delicious. Here's the deal. This story is from Daniel chapter 3. 
This is a time in the Old Testament when the Jews had been taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So I'm kind of a meanie, so what? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were Jews who had been given important leadership roles in Babylon. During this time, the king had made a giant gold statue. Whenever they heard the music play, the people were supposed to bow down to this statue and honor the king like he was a god. Bow before our glorious statue. It, it looks like just about everyone is bowing, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are still standing up. I'm guessing the king was not amused by this. <laughs> no, he wasn't. In fact, the order had gone out that if you did not bow down to the giant statue, then you would be thrown into the fiery furnace as punishment. When the king found out about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he was really angry. He summoned them immediately. Is it true that you will not bow down and worship the great statue? If you will not, you will be tossed into the blazing furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. I am furious. He doesn't sound that furious. I said I am furious. Better, but still not that menacing. I, mm -hmm. I picture an evil king with that long of a name sounding a bit more intimidating. Mm -hmm. I am furious. It's much better. Yeah, frankly, I'm a little scared right now. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't budge. They weren't going to bow down to anyone or anything but God. They knew they might die. If God didn't choose to deliver them from the fire, this would be it for them. But they trusted that God was always with them no matter what happened. They were willing to trust him with their lives. King Nebuchadnezzar was so angry that he ordered the furnace to be seven times hotter than usual. He had Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego tied up and thrown into the furnace. Throw them into the fire. The fire was so hot that the guards who had tossed them in were killed by the flames. Then King Nebuchadnezzar saw that there was a fourth person in the fire with him. I thought we put three people in there. It looks like there are four in there now. The fourth one looks like he is a son of the gods. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, can you hear me? Come out of there. King Nebuchadnezzar was amazed. Although Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fire, they were completely fine. Nothing was burned, not even their clothes. Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than worship any god except their own god. He made a new decree. Anyone who said anything against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego or their god would be sentenced to death. He even gave them another promotion. The end. That's a really cool story about trusting God. Thanks, Kellen. No problem. Always happy to help. Bye, y'all. It takes a lot to trust God enough to get thrown into a blazing furnace. Oh, yeah, it sure does. I mean, we get nervous enough playing the floor as lava in our studio. It makes me wonder what it really means to trust God. That sounds like a question of the day. Reveal the question! In three seconds, uh -oh. the floor is lava. Three, okay. two, oh. one. What does it mean to trust God? Hey! Oh, yeah, what are you doing up there? Just hanging out. Oh, okay, okay, that's fair enough. So, so, so what does it mean to trust God? For me, it's like an extra boost of courage. Mm. I feel safe. Yeah, whenever I get scared, I just think to myself, don't worry, God's big, he's got this. Yeah, hey, what about you? What does it mean to trust God? Talk it over with your friends, and we'll see you next time. In three seconds, the desk is lava. Whoa! Three. Two, one. That's the so-and-so show. You okay, John? No.